Great. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone joining us from around the world. We're so happy to have you here. Um, this is the... Common conversation. You froze there for a minute. Oh, I may I may freeze in and out. Anyone feel free to take over. Am I am I back? Okay. Um, I may freeze and I'll jump back on. But introducing, of course, Sandra Waddick from Boston College, um, who will take over this conversation with David Corton, who joins us. Welcome to everyone. I have posted some things in the chat and I will repost them as people join. Um, most importantly, please remain muted. Please put your comments in the chat. Um, we'll get to those to facilitate a conversation with David and Sandra as we go. Uh, the conversation for today is about from emergency to emergence. Um, before we turn it over to Sandra, David, uh, sorry, Michael, <coughs> If you'd like to say just a few things about EMA, and again, I'll get some information in the chat. Welcome, everyone. We're so pleased for you to be here today. Thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you, Erica. Thank you, uh, Sandra, for hosting these. And thank you, David, for joining. As you were saying, this is a special time. And what we have found at the Humanistic Management Association, hosting those spaces on those times can actually help us digest what's what's occurring and maybe even uh, give us a way to listen even more deeply and and lead to to renewed action and spirit and as this conversation is about emergence from emergency i think be prepared and deal with this proactively so i thank you all for for joining um i think uh, yeah david for for being with us over to sandra thank you michael um and hi everyone glad to see everyone um I have been an admirer of David Corton since I read his book in 1995, When Corporations Rule the World. And it just blew me away as a business school professor. I had never thought about things in the way that David was thinking about them. And it, it was part of what set me on a path to doing the kind of work uh, on system transformation that I'm doing today and the work with the intellectual shamans. And this is, as most of you know, an intellectual shamans webinar. So David, is, he wasn't in the book, but he certainly is representative of, of the healer, connector, and sense maker that, um, that the shaman is. So let me just give you a little bit of background about David. Um, he's the founder and president of Living Economies Forum, co-founder and board member and board chair for the, uh, for, uh, for board chair emeritus for Yes Magazine, which his wife Fran still edits. Um, an associate fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies and a full member of the Club of Rome. That, that's uh, uh, enough um, probably to uh, tell you the kind of uh, bona fides that he brings to this conversation. Um, he's best known for his seminal books that frame a new economy for what he calls the ecological civilization and his belief that we must transition to that. And that is in fact what he's going to talk about today. Um, he's published um, uh, in addition to When Corporations Rule the World, he's published Agenda for a New Economy and Change the Story, Change the Future, along with The Great Turning and several other books. Um, he, he is an, a global activist and thought leader and is, uh, holds PhD and, MI, and MBA degrees from Stanford University um, and also uh, taught for five years at the Harvard Business School, from which he escaped to go uh, in, to do go do international development work for many years, and then um, uh, realizing that wasn't probably going where he wanted it to go, he may talk a little bit about that. Um, he um, came back to the United States and has been doing this work that I just, just described since then. Um, I think you will really enjoy what David has to say. He's broad thinker, a great thinker, and he has incredible insight. So David, over to you. And uh, um, as um, Erica mentions in the chat, please put your questions into the chat and we will try to pull them up um, and have a conversation with David. He's gonna just briefly speak to us and then uh, or maybe for about half an hour and then we'll turn to a conversation for the rest of the time. So David, over to you. Thank you, Sandra. I love that he's gonna speak briefly for a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten used to the idea that our current situation, of course, is different than university lectures, but uh, brief means about five minutes. And so <laughs> uh, I, I feel like a half an hour is a total luxury, but I'm, I'm gonna try to keep this very 
fairly brief and on target because it is the discussion we want to do. And I want to I want to draw attention back to Sandra first of all. Um, we are in a time in which we have such need for intellectual uh, relationships and in, intellectual teamwork, uh, pushing one another deeper and deeper. And uh, I find Sandra's work on meta narratives and memes to be just that. And we have uh, we find ourselves aligning on so many things currently, and it's uh, it's quite lovely. Um, the, I mean, what I'll be talking about today is primarily about meta narratives um, and the recognition of the power of our meta narratives uh, to misdirect us as a species or to put us on path to, to new possibilities. And I hope that our conversation a little later on can focus on what the implications are for education, particularly in management and, and economics which need to come together much more closely, but around a wholly different frame uh, and different meta mean. Now, understanding my perspective, um, you know, when I look back, my, my focus throughout my life uh, turned out to be on learning in a way, uh, a perpetual student. Um, but that's been in very large segments. Uh, you know, for 13 years, uh, I was part of Stanford and Harvard Graduate Schools of Business with Stanford as a student and Harvard as faculty. Uh, I broke off from that and spent 30 years in international development work on a mission to end global poverty. And during that time, living for years in Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and then came to recognize the bankruptcy of much of that effort and have spent the last 25 years in global movements challenging economic orthodoxy. Uh, there's some overlap between those time periods, but I am uh, 82 now, so I look back on a, a long and, and uh, rich life. Um, as Sandra noted, uh, one key marking point in my life was what I call escaping from Harvard and academia on December 31st, 1977, uh, which is when I moved from Harvard to, uh, to Asia, where my wife and I lived for 15 years. Um, I've more recently been on another journey away from writing books to concentrating on getting the, the most powerful ideas that I can get my mind around and reduce them to the simplest and shortest language, which I think fits in with Sandra's work on, on memes and, and narratives. Uh, because it is, we, we live by our stories, and I'll say a little bit more about that as, as humans. But I wanna, I wanna first get the backdrop of uh, what, I don't know if you still use this term in business school, the big picture, but certainly at Stanford in my days there and, and Harvard, we always talked about the big picture. Uh, what that usually meant was a lot smaller picture than what uh, we would have to consider the big picture these days. But it's about stepping back from immediate problems and looking at deeper causes and uh, deeper systemic solutions. Now, what we're dealing with the moment globally is a monumental failure of an economic system uh, for which GDP growth is a defining goal and the primary responsibility of business is considered to be to grow the financial assets of their owners. And all of this is driven by a deeply flawed economics which has become kind of the defining story of our time. Now, these, I'm, I'm going to just go through some quick statistics that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but they, uh, our situation can be summed up first environmentally by the Global Footprint Network figure that <clears throat> human consumption currently is about 1.7 times what Earth's regenerative systems can sustain. So that means all that extra, all that extra consumption is actually destroying Earth's capacity to sustain life, and, and that is quite an emergency for us since we are living beings. Uh, um, and of course, we now have the 2018 UN um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, 
with their estimates that greenhouse gas pollution must be reduced by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 and 100% by 2050 to prevent irreparable consequences. Um, they don't talk about self-extinction, that will take longer, but that, that is absolutely the path that all this leads to. At the same time, we're dealing with the social statistics Oxfam pointing out this simple statistic that 26 billionaires now have personal financial assets equal to or greater than the poorest half of humanity, 3.9 billion people. Um, so I think we can all agree that maybe some inequality is okay, but uh, that's inequality beyond imagination and certainly beyond tolerance. Um, now, what this tells us is that overall, humanity's economic development experiment has been a colossal failure. It's also interesting what's coming out right now that here in the United States, where we have long prided ourselves on being the world's richest and most advanced nation, we're currently in competition to be the leading example of failure in the world. That should be a very, it makes it a very sobering moment. Now, what we're seeing ever more clearly is what we must resist. And we're, we're seeing more and more uh, demonstrations, a mark of our time, uh, around resistance against failure. Um, and yet one of, the, one of the things that I think you're all aware of, and it's certainly been a lesson of my life, Resistance alone is a, re is a losing strategy. That includes just you know, critique alone. We have to understand why we are failing, but we absolutely have to have a positive vision, um, a framework for moving ahead with, with deep consensus. And this, of course, comes back to where our, our meta stories come in. We're not talking about trivial narratives. We're talking about the, the, big, the big narratives that drive us as a species. Um, and also, you know, having lived in so many different parts of the world and so many different cultures, um, one becomes aware of the extraordinary diversity of our human possibilities. Um, and we have to have that in mind. So, you know, the, the, the most recent writing I've been doing, uh, trying to boil these issues down uh, takes me to three fundamental, uh, three fundamental uh, truths. Um, and I think you'll recognize as I state them, there are things that are not part of our, our common dialogue, but I think you'll all recognize them as, uh, as obvious. Um, I mean, so obvious that one wonders how we could so recklessly ignore them as a species when most all of us recognize them individually. Um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, trying to make sure I got my uh, notes in the right place here. Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, the basic truths <clears throat> Um, the first one, we are living beings born of and nurtured of a living earth. Human well-being depends on earth's well-being. Th that to me is probably the most fundamental truth that I've come to in my lifetime. Um, and it, of course, absolutely conflicts with the framing of so much of our management and economics education, which would have us believe essentially that we're financial beings and that our goal is to make money. Um, yet if we go back to nature and well, then we, <laughs> again, than we recognize in daily life. Uh, but a woman biologist pointed out to me, she says, you know, think of our bodies. 
Each of our bodies is comprised of tens of trillions of living cells that are continuously self-organizing, um, engaged in the management and exchange of, of nutrients, water, energy, and information. And as, <clears throat> as, however they do that, uh, it's, it's the most complex frame of organizing imaginable. Uh, but through that self-organization, they create the vessel of our consciousness and the vehicle of our human agency. And when they stop doing that, we die. And it's, it's an extraordinary uh, analogy, and I'm, I'm sure you all recognize it as soon as you hear it. It's, uh, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's beyond question, and yet it is almost totally alien to uh, our thinking about organization. Second fundamental truth. Humans are a choice-making species. We quite literally choose our future, but we have generally not done it consciously because uh, our cultures, which are essentially our, our meta stories, are foundational to our ability to organize as human tribes or, or human societies. You know, if we don't have a common story, um, we do not have a common frame for organizing. And that's where you begin to learn about the diversity of humanity uh, if, if you have the, the privilege of, of living in different countries and different cultures. Um, you begin to recognize the human possibilities. At the same time, you also recognize that uh, all, all humans are pretty much the same, although within any particular race or culture, we have our, uh, our continuum from the people who have a healthy psyche and all the way down to uh, the psychopaths who are incapable of, of, of caring or compassion. Um, and we need not name examples at the moment. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I've come to that is so foundational here is this recognition that what we refer to as culture and institutions, and with institutions, you think of government, or you can think of corporations, uh, think of money. Um, any of our most defining institutions, if you look at nature, there are no analogies in nature. Um, and I, you know, I've talked to you know, very thoughtful biologists about this. For example, nature has no equivalent of money. Um, it is engaged in constant exchange, but uh, not around, and, and they are symbiotic, they are in, in the big picture, most of them are symbiotic exchanges in one way or another. But there may be huge differences between the, uh, in the re reciprocity. And um, <clears throat> it is very rare that it involves immediate exchange. So, money itself, and it's very important to recognize this, that money is just a number. It has no value outside the human mind, and it is a value only uh, because we accept it in exchange for things of real value. And those things of real value are most often the creations of labor, either the labor of nature or the labor of people. Um, and it's absolutely, you know, again, this is another fascinating piece of it. As you begin to understand life, you recognize that, that life is a constant struggle against entropy. And so this labor is absolutely essential to that, um, to that overcoming the forces of entropy to continuously not only create order, but create order that is conscious and has a, a, a self-directing a capacity for self-directing agency. Um, so then we come to the third fundamental truth, which is that the drive to make money imperils the human future. You know, literally, we are organizing, we organize the economy in ways that we are destroying life to create fortunes for billionaires. 
it raises a fundamental question, are we in fact an intelligent species? And that of course is our challenge of the moment to <laughs> get control of our stories, recognize that we, you know, we do have the intelligence to identify our stories, the role they play in our lives. Um, with that knowledge, we can bring our common stories into line with the deepest of our understanding. And of course, in putting that understanding together, we've got to break out of our disciplinary boxes. Uh, we have to draw on the absolute leading edges of science, but as well going back to indigenous knowledge, the, uh, the lesson, the, 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 the values, principles of our, our leading religions, uh, uh, and quite literally every source of human understanding. Uh, to, to frame our new deeper story of the nature of reality of our human possibilities and what they mean for uh, the future that we want together. Um, now, okay, time is going by. Let me, um, let me jump to the three, what I see as currently, three defining human priorities. Um, you know, again, this is part of the, of the effort to, to simplify, but, you know, we've essentially defined our, our global purpose around growing GDP. And we have to shift from the focus on GDP to, you know, more and more people are talking about well-being, well-being indicators. Uh, and of course, we're talking about the well-being of both people and earth. Um, and that quite literally needs to become the defining focus of our, our human priorities. Um, <clears throat> in fact, it, well, it's interesting, I, you know, an interesting conversation about growth. Uh, somebody was telling me, but growth is essential to life. Uh, but of course, if you look at growth in life, it takes place within a cycle. the equivalent of the perpetual growth that uh, uh, a, a defective economics has thrust on us. Um, so, you know, if we, if we focus on well-being, um, you know, I'm fascinated by all of the things that we could begin to identify where we could actually reduce consumption significantly uh, and in the process, improve the quality of life. You know, the first one that comes to mind, the first and most obvious is, is war and the preparations for war. Um, very hard to see where war as, a, as an institution, a way of playing out history is, has been beneficial either to earth or to humanity. Um, but then you get all of the other areas where we have opportunities for, for example, planned obsolescence, advertising to promote obsessive consumption, uh, our creation of an automobile dependent society, all of which of course have important implications for management business education. Um, the second priority um, is redirecting power from corporations to communities. Those of you who know my work, uh, that of course has been a, a, a key feature of it. The, uh, you know, tracing the, the transfer of power from communities to corporations, increasingly transnational corporations, um, which are totally delinked from any community or community accountability or even any life serving purpose other than making money for their, uh, essentially their richest owners. Um, you know, and that's simply a, 
an intolerable organizational model. If we're living beings, our existence depends on our ability to organize as communities that create and maintain the conditions of their own existence, just like the community of our body does. But it's the same basic dynamic or principle with uh, you know, biological systems of any kind um, and bioregions and our need to, uh, to organize as bioregions, which we can only do organizing as communities, not just of humans, but also of, of place-defined communities of people and nature uh, that are fundamentally self-reliant in the management of their material resources in continuously regenerative ways or cyclical ways, uh, while globally sharing inform useful information and technology and and so forth, so that we can all learn together and all improve well being across uh, the system. Um, you know, this has enormous implications for rethinking and redistributing, redistributing ownership. Uh, overall, I would say the, the transnational uh, limited liability corporation, uh, certainly profit maximizing corporation is basically an illegitimate institution and it's probably an institution that we need to, to move beyond and get rid of entirely. Um, it also, you know, money is not going to go away. Sometimes some people accuse me of arguing that we should eliminate money. Uh, please be clear that is not my suggestion. Money can be a very useful tool, but we have to recognize it is only a tool and manage it accordingly. Uh, so transforming systems of finance to restore basic banking, make money creation a transparent public process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is all part of redirecting power from corporations to communities. Then <clears throat> uh, the, third, the third priority, um, and actually a lot of people have said, you know, this is, uh, this is really important. It used to be the, for a time, it was the core of my work. I, um, was at one point, I think, recognized as kind of the leading management consultant to the world's population family planning programs, but we've moved away from that. But basically, it has to be a human priority to uh, manage our, our procreation, essentially, and shift our priority from growing our human population, which tends to be good for GDP, but rather focus on the the raising of our young, the preparation of our young, every child, a wanted child and a cared for child, cared for not just by parents, but by a community and prepared for responsible, creative adulthood within a, a thriving uh, living earth community. Um, so again, those would be my kind of three suggestions for human priorities at the moment. Redirect our purpose from growing GDP to securing well-being, redirect power from corporations to communities, and redirect procreation from growing population to preparing the young. Um, now, all of this suggests that we don't want to, uh, um, we don't want to get back to business as usual. We want to get onto a path for transformation. And that comes back to um, the, the theme of, of this session from emergency, and we've talked a good deal about emergency, to emergence. And that emergence refers to a, you know, what increasingly is described as a new civilization. Um, and that is not my, you know, it's not my, that term did not originate with me, actually nothing that I, Nothing I say to you originated with me. Um, these are all just things that I have learned as kind of common wisdom over the over the years. Um, but our, you know, I, I like the idea of a civilizational transition because it signifies this is not about kind of tweaking the edges of a broken system. This is a failed system, and if we are to have the future that have a viable future, let alone the future that we want, 
um, essentially everything has to change. Deep changes, cultural, institutional, technological, and infrastructure. Um, and as you begin to put those together and you look at our current situation, you begin to realize the extent to which we have organized society in ways that make it virtually impossible for the individual to make totally ethical decisions. Because that system as it exists pushes most of the world's people into a daily struggle for survival. Uh, you know, some of us, <laughs> our struggle for survival is a lot more advantageous than others, but it's incredible even the extent, you know, the number, the percentage of our population, even here in the U.S., that is, is just torn daily, um, running from job to job, running from task to task with hardly any time for to sit back or reflect or, or, or even rest, um, all imposed by a, a system that, uh, that gives us very, very few options. Um, and I, th you know, many of you here are more, are, are certainly closer to my generation. Um, I suspect you're, you know, those who share my generation uh, are aware, look back at when we were young, um, the sense of opportunity. Um, you know, I, I came from a, a, a one could say a privileged background, but a very, very modest middle class background. And, you know, I never had a concern about would I be able to get a job or make a living when I grew up that, you know, I could think about what do I most want to do with my life? Um, you know, I could get through through college with with no debt. Um, most of today's youth do not have those options. Um, and it, it's amazing with my own children recognizing how different their lives are. They've, you know, well, they both got good educations, but you know, they basically struggle day to day to put put the basic means of of living together. Um, you know, this is this is basically intolerable, and it's inexcusable. Um, so. Actually, with that, I think yeah, okay, we're uh, we're at the uh, <laughs> the half hour mark. Um, so let me turn this back to you, Sandra. What where I'd like to take this is for a mutual exploration on what what you see is the implications, given your experience and most of your experience in universities, in uh, in business schools, the teaching of management and economics. What does all this tell us for where we we need to go with how we're how we're how we're thinking about the deepening and sharing of knowledge um, academically, and the preparation of next generations and uh, the forthcoming managers, um, and what you know what is the role of that education? So, Sandra, back back over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, David. That was terrific. Um, there are a number of comments and questions um, that have come up in the chat while you were speaking. So um, there's also a raise hand function. If anybody wants to use that while well, David is replying, if you want to get into a conversation, you can feel free to. I think I can see that. If you raise your hand. Um, so um, uh, Gerard Ferrius. Gerard, it's great to see so many people I know on this call. Actually, uh, Gerard, you had a couple of questions. Could you ask me yeah. one that's most important to you? Yeah, the first one was really more of a, a comment that it just struck me as David was speaking that uh, that most of the self successful self organizing that we see, like the cells in our body, uh, seem to work. By, whereas when we try to self organize, we just always mess it up. But my my bigger question is really about uh, about the role of property rights, uh, mm -hmm. and and the context and how that has because I I one thing that strikes me is we rarely hear about the role of property rights and what and uh, particularly from an indigenous perspective 
who who see property as 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 community mm -hmm. and and would and see themselves as caretakers of the earth whereas the perspective that we see today particularly from a neoclassical perspective sees ourselves as exploiters and owners of the earth mm -hmm. so uh, i just wonder if you could uh, Western well, problem of our of our Western culture um, that we have taken to the world essentially, which is our focus on human rights. Uh, you know, it's fascinating that we treat uh, our, our focus on rights says nothing about responsibilities. If you look at this at the deeper level, you come to realize that there really are no rights without responsibilities. Um, and we begin to put this together, but I would argue that virtually every right that we possess as a human being also comes with responsibilities of, of being a human being. And being responsible, including for our capacity as a species to choose, um, we are a distinctive species in this regard. Um, I'm certainly not aware of any other species that has this capacity for choice, uh, nor am I aware of any species uh, that has this capacity for, for damage to other life forms. Um, certain viruses can certainly take us on, but you know we're not going to be done in by this uh, by a virus in the end. Um, but we do have the potential. <clears throat> I mean, with our, uh, with our nuclear technology, we probably have the potential to end all life on this planet. That's an extraordinary power. Um, so, uh, property rights. If we have property rights, they come with, uh, with definite responsibilities. But we also need to, well, when we talk about inequality, uh, the most fundamental and most damaging inequality is the inequality in ownership. It is far more important than the inequality in income, even as important as that is. Uh, because that, that ownership is generally connected in some way or another to property rights. And here's where I totally agree with you that the indigenous perspective comes in, that the earth on which we depend was not created by any human. Uh, therefore, no human has the right to control and destroy it. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we know in terms of in terms of social power, political power, um, if you don't have any property rights, your vote is probably worthless. Um, you know, if you don't have rights to, uh, to 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 money or some some set of assets, your your influence over the pop over the politicians is virtually nil. Um, so. We need to fundamentally rethink property rights, combine them with the responsibilities, and figure out how they should be allocated. Um, and to me, the, the framing thought should be that to the extent possible, each person should control their access to their means of living. So if you live by farming, you ought to have some rights of control or uh, over the land that you depend on. Um, I believe every person ought to have some rights to the, the place in which they live, uh, the, the home, their residence. But does that mean you have a right to own vast apartment complexes uh, in which uh, millions of people depend on you for their housing? Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, should some corporation control all the farmland in the world or all the seeds or whatever? Uh, definitely not. Um, so anyhow, the, the, I mean, the, the, the framing of the question you raise is, is huge and absolutely foundational. So uh, Ignacio Pavez, you had a question um, about the COVID-19 implications and if you could add business school to your question, but maybe you want to frame it for David. Are you still here? Yes, I'm here. Um, 
Hi, David. Um, oh, here's my working phone at home. Um, yeah, my question is, is about your thoughts um, about what, what do you think will be some societal and business changes that will be accelerated with the uh, COVID crisis? For example, many companies now has been, uh, has have to changes um, like, uh, for example, uh, transition to new technologies, uh, maybe have to uh, develop some practices that uh, are devoted to care for people uh, because they, um, they are experiencing much more stress than uh, before. Maybe there are new partnerships that they have to develop uh, at a big scale, I think. Uh, for example, maybe we can have more, uh, the, the, the pandemics is um, uh, like an example of what kind of uh, changes we'll experience in the future uh, related to climate change. So I, I wonder what are your thoughts about the, the changes that, that the COVID crisis is accelerating as a society and for business. Yeah, I hear you're talking about um, control of knowledge <coughs> and technology. I believe that's, that's a key piece of it. Um, you know, one of the things that I've observed again in my life is that the people who are truly, cre who are truly creative um, are not creating for the money. They, they are doing their creation because um, it is a great source of, of satisfaction. It's, it's thrilling to be creative, and it is particularly thrilling to be creative in ways that are beneficial to others and improve the lives of others. Um, now, I think that it makes perfect sense that a person who, or even a, an organization that is responsible for a major discovery uh, may get some financial reward for it. Um, I have no problem with that at all. Um, but first of all, that should recognize that no invention is truly unique. Every unique. Oh, perhaps you're, you, you get some right to a certain amount of profits from that technology for a time, but the idea of having being able to have an absolute monopoly and say one company comes up with uh, uh, with a, <clears throat> a, a a an immunization for COVID-19 and it's the only one wow <clears throat> you got the rights to that for what 20 years or more um, you could make a lot of money while half of the human population dies or whatever you know that's absolutely absurd uh, there's no way that should be allowed. Um, so again, fundamental rethinking. I'm, but uh, you know, other things that I'm interested. The see when when we get the uh, the COVID nineteen has been so useful in exposing so much. Um, you know, it's not just these issues of intellectual property rights, but the fundamental importance of a, of a system of healthcare accessible to everyone, regardless of income or documentation. You know, it's, it, it's not only essential to the well being of the individuals, it's, it's essential to the well being of all of us. Uh, something is very hard to see, but you know, COVID 19 has really brought it forward. Uh, the need for just compensation and job security for those who do our most essential and often our least rewarded work. Uh, the need for a guarantee that if your job evaporates, you won't starve. The fundamentally organizational principle of the limits of efficiency. We have organized the global economy almost exclusively around the idea of efficiency, again, as defined by money. Um, <clears throat> we've forgotten about redundancy and the, the importance of short supply chains, especially for essentials. Um, <clears throat> so these are just a few of the ways that um, <clears throat> COVID-19 have awakened us. 
So, so David, I'm going to stop there yeah. because there's a ton of questions and I okay. like, <laughs> right. can't get through. Um, so if, if you could make your questions fairly short and your uh, maybe the response is a little shorter so we can get to, to more of them. Um, oh, uh, uh, I lost. The, oh, Mark Krieger, you had your hand up. You want to? Mark, are you still here? Mark? Um, Mark's question was, I would like to address the question of creating long-term viable collective vision for humanity. How to share it and what should we become and how do we do it? Yeah, well, basically, um, to me, it centers around um, what I refer to as the, the three fundamental truths. Um, it, 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 it just starts with getting clear that we are living beings born of and nurtured by a living earth and our well-being depends not only on earth's well-being but the well-being of one another. Uh, I made a visit to South Africa last year and became very, uh, expo introduced to the African idea of Ubuntu. Um, I am because we are. Um, you know, it's such a simple phrase but if you recognize we is one another and we is nature um, such a profound truth in so few words I am because we are if you know if, if we did nothing but got that meta narrative uh, or we might call it that meme <laughs> as a foundational frame uh, we're basically on our way to uh, to a different future but of course, you know, when you get into the details, the details are horrendous and profound and overwhelming. But the basics are simple. I've always loved the idea of Ubuntu. Um, Judy Neal, you had a question. You want to uh, come in and raise it? Thank you. Hi, David. How are you? Ah, oh, fine. Welcome to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, my question is, um, can you give us any examples of organizations, movements, communities, um, anything that really gives you hope right now that might be an example of what we could do more of in the future? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> you know, my wife and I live here on Bainbridge Island in the Puget Sound next to Seattle. Um, <clears throat> oh, you know, we've worked together on these issues all our lives. Um, but there's a very interesting, uh, I shouldn't say split because it's certainly no way to vision, but, um, but the difference in our focus that uh, I am focused on these global conversations and particularly with the Club of Rome and so forth. Um, Fran has deeply gotten deeply immersed in our local community um, around issues of climate change, transportation. Um, last night she led a discussion around a movie about biking and the place of biking and how all the, all the benefits of, of biking. And as part of a discussion about how we could reduce our dependence of, on cars on Bainbridge. Now that's, you know, that's very localized, but what I sense is that those kind of conversations are springing up all over the world. Uh, and people are rethinking uh, those fundamentals at a, at a local level, most everywhere. Um, and that I think is a source of, of real hope and it's, it's, it's a recognition um, that we need to come, come back together uh, connecting as communities. I mean, one of the really destructive things that's happening <clears throat> in the United States and in other, other countries that we think of as advanced and high income um, <clears throat> is the number of people who are living alone, the number of single parent households. Uh, but they are reflective of an isolation that is, uh, that is totally anti-life and anti-human. Um, and it's, it's fascinating how the, the, the distancing of COVID-19 
is forcing us to rethink and, and reconnect. And it's, it's, the, the contradictions are, are, <laughs> are, are really fascinating. But it, it, it's almost like there was some f supernatural force at work uh, that said, you know, you guys are, uh, you guys are missing something and <laughs> we got to get our heads straightened out. Um, it's almost like uh, like uh, the man that lives in the White House in Washington is also committed to helping us recognize our need to come together if we're going to have uh, have a future. Um, just by in a sense demonstrating um, how awful, <laughs> how inappropriate our, our, our national leadership can be, and the need to organize uh, organize locally. Um, and take control and responsibility of, of, of our own lives through community. Judy, that was a great question. Um, Julie um, Smenzuk O'Brien, um, maybe you'd like to raise your question about indigenous wisdom, because I think it really relates to what David was just talking about. Julie, you still here? Um, I am on my phone, so it's a little bit uh, harder, but um, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, David, I'm um, interested in a pers the pe perspective you might have on um, what some might consider to be like quaint, old, and irrelevant theories of living, you know, an, an indigenous perspective. And uh, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, for most of human history, or not history, but human experience since modern humans, um, humans lived in uh, in tribes, um, uh, dependent on one another and on the nature and the place where they lived. Um, and of course, they did it without uh, without money. Um, they certainly had no corporations. Um, and they the concept of government. There, I mean, there are no governmental institutions. There were processes of of self governance. Um, and you know those varied in their effectiveness, and they varied in their degree of of of, of peace and mutual support and love and so forth. Uh, but they, at their best, they absolutely demonstrated the foundations of life and our our possibilities for living and organizing together as community. Um, and. You know, there there are many places in the world where those communities, even now, are quite beautiful, or at least were uh, until um, until the intrusion of, uh, of 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 modern culture and and economics. Um, but they do demonstrate our possibilities, and there is so much that we need to learn from them. Um, and I have a sense that. A lot of this learning might well come out of Africa, which, of course, was the original birthplace of humanity. Um, and it's an interesting conversation that's sort of emerging there of, uh, of you know, what are those lessons from the, the very earliest of, of, of humans uh, that, that have, have immediate, uh, an important application to, to modern society. A very important area of learning. Thank you. Um, so Emma and Steve, you have a, a question that's more core to the question David actually wanted to speak to. Hi, hi everybody. Hi David, and, and thanks Sandra. Um, we're speaking from England, uh, from Derbyshire, in, in the middle of England, and so mm -hmm. we are uh, grateful for the chance to speak to you. My question really concerns a particular program and process that I've been involved heavily for the last 30 or 40 years of the idea of repurposing the university mm -hmm. uh, to uh, and the objectives of a university to really further human progress and and well-being rather than economic man and, and woman uh, pur purposed in the in sense of what you've just espoused or not espoused but stated you know seeking for further growth and uh, and growth uh, at all costs. I mean, our, our world is unsustainable at the moment, as you've uh, articulated. But our universities are largely some of the people who have led that unsustainability. Yes. And yet, yes. they are continuing that progress, expanding yes. at an enormous rate across the world, 
but with the same kind of purpose that we seek further and further progress in terms of economic growth. How do we change that process? Ah. You know, I would, I would turn that question back to you folks, but it, it certainly is the profound question. Um, you know, if you wanted to really block human learning, uh, one way to do it would be to take the world's uh, smartest and most creative people and lock them into universities where they each have to choose a, uh, an intellectual silo, uh, publish their findings in referee journey, journals that then assume legal ownership of their ideas. Um, I don't have to go further with that, but on and on and then get students in lecture halls where you have them uh, transcribe your lecture into notes and then give them tests that require them to recite those facts back, uh, which of course destroys their capacity for real learning from life situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is unfathomable how far our universities and the most of our educational systems go from the kind of learning processes that we need to advance. Um, if we were to think about, wow, <clears throat> you know, this, this is a question that came up actually uh, in, in my own experience. The, the last course I taught at the Harvard Business School was a course called Management in the Future. It was a doctoral seminar it built from the Clover Rome uh, study of the time. This is back in 1970s, uh, the limits to growth. And we actually had an extraordinary uh, conversation and exchange with the whole th throughout the course about if we took these issues of the limits of growth seriously, how would humanity and business and business education have to change? Um, that actually ro 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 <laughs> brought in a question on the faculty. Is the purpose of the Harvard Business School to prepare young people for success in business as it exists, the system of business as it exists, or is it to prepare those students to transform that system? I think that is exactly the question we face here. Um, and I, I don't know how we transform academia. Obviously, there are, there are good aspects to it, but it's, you know, it's very interesting, the, the closing down of classes and so forth and moving them on to the web. And one could say, well, any, any class that can be taught in a lecture hall can probably be taught just as well on Zoom. And there's no reason for the, you know, the students to have to travel someplace and live in a dormitory and have all the expense. Uh, just give them a bunch of lectures on Zoom and let them take the tests and so forth. If we're actually going to gather students together in a location, uh, what are the advantages of gathering them in a, you know, a, a set of ancient buildings, um, e even in seminar discussions? But th because the seminar discussions are themselves detached from reality. Or are there totally different models of using, um, you know, kind of extension education or adult education, where instead of trying to replicate the siloed university within the classroom, um, you support students in learning from real projects together? What if we actually engaged? students in solving some of the key problems in their community and then got them together periodically for discussions of what are they learning and how, how is that learning taking place? And is that learning integrating into the community and transforming that community's ability to work together? I don't know how you do this, and I don't know what all the possibilities are, but these are these are some of the questions that have been coming to my mind as we uh, 
uh, you know, we, we, we try to learn from our current experience and the disruption that could I, yeah. could I just give you a quick quick insight to a college many years ago in Australia called Hawkesbury Agricultural College. Mm -hmm. It disbanded the the curriculum in agricultural education and sent its students out into the rural communities to live with farmers and rural people and really explore what the issues those people were facing. They then went back to the college and co-created answers to those issues. Now that experiment was a marvelous example of where our education system should be. That's many years ago, but that college no longer exists. Yeah. But it's actually, you can read about Hawkesbury College if you Google it, and it's, the story is a fascinating one. Yeah. Thank you, Steve and Dave. Um, we're a little bit over our time, and there are so many good questions that I wish we could have gotten to. Um, but I just want to um, thank you, David, and thank all of you for sticking around. Um, at the peak, there were about 145 people here. Um, and um, David, thank you so much for um, this perspective. I think that you it's really very helpful. And I really wish we could have got to all these questions because there's so many good ones here. But thank you, everyone. We'll be doing this again probably in the fall, um, maybe sooner, who knows. But let uh, me just add my thanks, our thanks to Sandra. Thank you so much for moderating, facilitating, organizing, leading.